Hello. This is a video about the relationship between four things aperture, ISO, shutter speed and illumination. These things are related no matter what sort of photography you're doing but the uh, relationship can become a bit more difficult to handle when you're doing uh, macros or close-ups but especially with macros by which I mean images of subjects which are less than an inch across or so. First let's have a look at three of those factors aperture, ISO and shutter speed. So I've got a camera set up here it's in manual mode so I've got complete control of the aperture, the ISO and the shutter speed. And at the moment if we have a look at what the exposure meter is telling us it reckons that it's correctly exposed. Now I'm not suggesting that you should use the camera's exposure meter to tell actually whether your images are correctly exposed or not. A lot of mine the camera says that I'm underexposing them but for the sake of this exercise I'm going to use the camera's exposure meter so that we can see what's going on. So I've got a thirteenth of a second f5.6 and ISO 100. Suppose that I want to have greater depth of field so I want to in, uh, decrease the aperture. So I'm going to decrease it from 5.6 by a couple of stops. So that's f11. The camera now says that we're two stops underexposed which is what you'd expect and I can offset that by using a longer exposure. So if I go uh, to a sixth and what's that, a third of a second, we're back to where we started. So I've offset a change in aperture with a change in shutter speed. Suppose then that I want even more depth of field so I want to increase, uh, decrease sorry, the aperture some more but I don't want the shutter speed to go any slower. I can increase the ISO. So first of all I'll increase the aperture, decrease the aperture. Not doing very well with that am I? So that's another two stops and we're two stops underexposed again and now I'm going to change the ISO by two stops and we're back to being correctly exposed, well almost correctly exposed again, I think the light level must have changed slightly. Uh, and I can then suppose I say well look that's a very slow shutter speed, I want it faster, I don't want to change the aperture because I want that great big depth of field, so I'm going to increase the ISO some more. So what I'll do is speed up the shutter speed by two stops, Still quite slow, a thirteenth of a second, and I'll take the ISO. What did I just change? I'll change the ISO up two stops, and we're back to being roughly the right exposure. Now, this is often referred to as the exposure triangle because you've got three things relating to one another. You've got aperture, ISO and shutter speed and if you change one of them you've got to change one of the others or some combination of the other two. There are some consequences of changing any of these, quite apart from the fact that they alter, that you have to make balancing changes with the other ones. And this, by the way, is all talking about natural light at the moment. We'll come on to using additional sources of light later on. So the consequences, for example, with ISO, if you raise the ISO, uh, you're going to get noise and you'll lose detail, the noise will mask uh, 
details, which is not a good thing for close-up photography or macros. If you decrease the shutter speed, you'll get blur, or you may do, from a couple of sources. One is, if you're working handheld, you'll get handshake, will cause blur, or whether you're hand operating handheld or on a tripod, you may get subject motion. Okay. If you change the aperture, you change the depth of field, which is maybe why you are changing the aperture to get the depth of field you want. Um, but in doing that, you get a softer image because of diffraction. You lose details. Now, there are things you can do about this. For example, with ISO and noise, you can use noise reduction. Although the noise reduction itself will tend to reduce the level of detail more because noise reduction works by essentially smudging details. What you can do is that you can take a, a lot of photos and add them together in order to reduce the noise. Or you can take a lot of photos and if you've got the software to do it, you can actually get more detail out of the uh, image by combining them. With Handshake, you can take a lot of photos, but in this case, rather than adding them together, you pick one. You pick the sharpest of the bunch. I use that quite a lot. With depth of field, you can take a lot of photos, you can add them together, you can stack them in order to increase the depth of field. And if you're doing that, you can use a larger aperture because you're not trying to get as small an aperture as possible or use as small as an aperture as you can in order to get as much depth of field as you can. This way, when you're stacking, you can use a larger aperture which suffers less from diffraction. And when you add them together, you'll get an overall sharper image. It'll be both sharper and it'll have more depth of field. Now we can go on to the fourth factor. So you've got all this lot interacting here and all the things that play off one another and the things that you may do about them. Then you've got illumination. So you might have the sun. You might have a cloudy day. Or you might be using a flash or a lamp. Or another flash or lamp, perhaps shining on a different part of the scene, perhaps on the background, to light it up. And you may modify the light from these sources. For example, with bright sunshine, you may use a reflector. Here we go. Here's a reflector. I enjoy this bit. Let's hope I don't knock anything down. Oh, there we go. And you've got different colours so that you can reflect light and change the colour of the reflected light a bit. And you've got a diffuser as well. So if you've got bright sunlight coming down on your subject, you can have that there if you've got someone to hold it or you can work out some way of putting it in position. And if you've got... So that's a reflector or a diffuser. The light comes through the diffuser. Similarly, if you're using flash, you may use a diffuser. Here's a flash unit with a diffuser on it, a single flash unit. And inside this, if we have a look, if you'll be able to see this, there's a couple of bits of polyst extended polystyrene there and some plastic paper underneath it and some plastic paper here on top. And that diffuses the light, makes it more even. Here's another flash unit with the same principle, but it's got two flashes on it and you can 
equal to the position of them and the distance of them from the subject. Suppose you're using a flash. I'm going to use a lamp as an example. What I'm, I'll show you now what I'm going to do because it's going to get a bit dark in a minute in here. Um, I'm going to have this subject here. I'm going to put a close-up lens on the camera and instead of flash, because it make it easier to do this way, I'm going to put a lamp here and I'm going to illuminate the subject with a lamp and we're going to see what exposure I need. Then I'm going to move this about twice as far away from the subject and we'll see how that changes the amount of light that we need. And I'm also going to hold a diffuser in front of the light source when it's up on here. Um, and again, we'll see how much light we need. This diffuser is differently constructed from the others. It's got, there we go, it's all this plastic paper stuff. I don't know if you can see. It's got two layers of plastic paper here, one complete one and one partial one, smaller one. And on the bit at the front, and again, I don't know if you can see this, it's got three layers of plastic paper underneath the uh, three smaller ones of different sizes underneath the uh, big one. The reason for having um, these different sized ones is to try and get as even a spread of light as possible from this. And so I hold it up against the mirror and take photos and see where the bright spots are and I add more bits in. That's the way I do it with all my diffusers to try and work them out. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn the level of light down in the room so that that lamp is contributing pretty much all the light to the scene. And I'm going to have this about six inches away from the subject. And I'm now going to uh, I'll turn the ISO up a bit, I think, to make this a bit more reasonable. And uh, or maybe, well, let's just see what it says here. Um, if I can manage to point the camera at this. Uh, let me change the aperture a bit. I wouldn't actually be using an aperture this small, but it might make the... Oh, yes, I should be in aperture priority mode as well. Okay. Um, so there we go, and okay, I will put the aperture back to something like I might actually use. So it's now saying for a properly exposed photo, it wants 125th of a second. And I'm not going to change the aperture of 22, and I'm not going to change the ISO of 6400. I'm simply going to move the lamp. So that's 100, it's varying between 100th and 160th. So let's call it 125th. I'm now going to move the lamp, raise it up, and put it about a foot away from the subject. And if we have another look here, now the camera's, oh, there we go. And it now wants a fiftieth uh, of a second, fortieth of a second, forty, eighty, what's that? Um, something like two stops, eightieth, uh, one sixty. Yeah, it's about a two stop difference. So it needs about two stops more light uh, than it needed when the lamp was half the distance away. I think I got my numbers right there. Let's hope so. Um, the other thing was, if I go back and again point this, we got um, a fortieth, I think it was. Uh, yes, uh, it's a, a fortieth. If I can get it there, yeah, if I get it on the face, it's a fortieth. So I'm now going to try and hold this. This is a bit of a difficult exercise and it's all a bit approximate. Uh, I'm going to try and hold the diffuser in front of the light and then with the other hand, and this camera's a bit heavy, um, 
it wants a sixth of a second, a tenth of a second, a thirteenth of a second, about a tenth of a second. As opposed to, was it a fortieth of a second, which again, that means that the, this particular diffuser is stopping about two stops of light. Uh, and in fact, I've got other diffusers which, oddly enough, even though they're differently constructed, the ones I showed you previously, uh, stop about the same amount of light, even though under the surface um, they've actually got some expanded polystyrene um, instead of some of these layers of plastic paper. So let's have a think now, so we can see that um, you need to be aware of how um, you're arranging your light sources uh, and the light from them, how that affects the amount of light on the scene and what the impact is for um, the uh, aperture ISO shutter speed relationship. Now let's look at some specific examples. Um, at night, if you take, uh, you're using flash obviously at night, and um, the flash is, is providing all the light for the scene. In that case, it doesn't really matter what the shutter speed is uh, because there's virtually no light getting into the camera from anywhere other than the flash, and the flash is very quick. And so the effective shutter speed that you're using is the length of the flash burst, which may be between a 200th of a second and a 4,000th of a second, something like that. But when you're using flash, especially at night, um, there's no ambient light falling on the scene, and so you may get dark backgrounds, and you may want to use an extra flash to illuminate the background. If you're operating with flash, suppose it's a dull day here in the UK, often have to use flash when I'm doing closer of macros. Um, so you've got mixed lighting. Some of it's being provided by coming through the clouds on an overcast day. Some of it's coming from the flash. In that circumstance, the effective shutter speed isn't the same as the flash speed because of the contribution of the ambient light. And you can get caught out with that. You might think, well, I'm using flash. It doesn't matter what shutter speed I'm using. Well, it does. Because if you open the shutter for a long time, it may pick up enough ambient light in order to actually provide you with a blurred image. The other thing is with dark backgrounds, you can get those during the day as well. And you might use another flash on the background as you might at, uh, in the dark, or you might raise the ISO or use the longer shutter speed to give the ambient light, um, to get more ambient light onto the scene, which will uh, brighten up all of the scene, not just the bit that you're focusing the flashlight on. If it's in bright daylight, you may be able to get a, a small aperture, a fast shutter speed and a low ISO, wonderful, except that you may have very harsh shadows, in which case you might want to use a flash to put some fill flash in, which will, oddly enough, um, adding, it seems a bit counterintuitive, but by adding extra light to the scene, you can actually even the lighting out and, and uh, get rid of the harsh shadows. Or you can use a reflector to reflect sunlight onto uh, the scene again to even it out. Um, or use a diffuser to, um, to calm the light down before it gets to the subject. And if you're using high magnification, you get loss of light. I've talked about this in other videos. Um, the effective aperture that you're using as the magnification increases is less than what the camera tells you you're getting. Uh, that's not true with acromats, but it is with prime macro lenses, uh, reverse lenses, um, extension tubes, and teleconverters and bellows. Um, you can. Oh yeah, this can this can force the ISO up because there's not much light now getting onto the sensor. Uh, it can force the ISO up so much um, that you have trouble actually with your flash unit um, providing enough light. So you have to raise the ISO 
um, even though you're using flash. And also it can make it very difficult to actually see what's happening if you're using a viewfinder uh, and make it difficult for the camera to focus. That's true at light, night as well, obviously. You have to shine the light on the subject uh, in order to be able to focus. So there we go. There's a quick run through. Um, you've got the exposure triangle and the complications that that um, produces. You've got the various light sources and the way you can modify them. And to get good close-up and macro photographs, I think you need to be aware of this stuff and you need to play with it and experiment to find out what works in which circumstances. So, that's it for now. Goodbye.